um, is part of my new research. So I was uh, doing a dissertation on hack labs and hacker spaces before, and uh, my new research is on the uh, social history of IRC and uh, the contemporary use of this uh, protocol. So uh, some of the um, of the ideas that I will present today have a great deal of uh, hand waving in them, where I didn't uh, work out the details yet and uh, didn't um, spend a lot of time thinking about them. And uh, the talk is in uh, three parts. So um, the first part is uh, the first two parts are empirical. So um, I just want to uh, present in a very short. Um, way the how i understand the history of uh, chat protocols in general and uh, what is the kind of sad thing about the history of chat protocols and uh, then uh, i will talk about the contemporary use of irc and how different kind of users use uh, irc in different ways and uh, the third part of the talk we are trying to put these two stories together and uh, bring out some general conclusions about um, why is it interesting to see how um, innovators are using old technologies and what is the political meaning of refusing to use some new technologies and uh, continue to maintain and update old technologies. So I will start with chat history right away. Um, without any uh, comments. So there was, uh, in the beginning, chat was uh, some kind of uh, uh, program. Some p in uh, the 4.2 BSD, there was talk. Maybe it was uh, one of the first uh, solutions that was uh, really deployed as part of an operating system. And uh, there were a, a lot of other um, solutions for the different uh, systems that, that existed before the, inter before the World Wide Web. Um, so, uh, one of the interesting uh, notions here uh, that I found is that uh, many of these um, solutions used analogies uh, which were not to chat rooms, as a uh, um, lot of people are talking about them now, but they used uh, chat channels and they re referred to the uh, CB radio, like the CompuServe uh, CB simulator. And so the reason why um, there are channels on uh, on IRC and not uh, um, not chat rooms. Is because uh, it is a radio analogy. You have to tune uh, to a channel, and uh, of course this is still a, a metaphor. But some people uh, think that it's a more uh, precise metaphor because you just have this stream uh, of me messages, and then you select which ones uh, you want to um, you want to uh, read on your computer. So. Um, most of these. Uh, there are two characteristics here. Uh, one is that uh, basically none of uh, the early chat programs were initiatives uh, by the makers of these uh, systems, or for example by uh, CompuServe. They were usually in individual initiatives, and then they became, um, they, there was two um, features that were in interesting in how they became part of uh, BBSs or how they became part of uh, CompuServe or Plato. That uh, on the one hand, uh, they became uh, really popular, really fast. Uh, on the other hand, uh, even if they were the most popular services uh, on some of these systems, um, the chat users were seen as a kind of uh, unwashed uh, masses as uh, uncivilized uh, people uh, by the system administrators and by the operators of these, uh, of these platforms. And uh, sometimes, because at that point, uh, bandwidth was a scarce resource, these people um, were seen in a quite bad light uh, by the operators. Um, some, there are some discussions uh, from the 1980s where they are saying that uh, these people are not worth the bandwidth that uh, they are using, and they are just talking about irrelevant uh, things. So somehow, um, when we talk about uh, social history, we talk about uh, history from the point of view of uh, the underdogs, no? 
and uh, somehow uh, chat users uh, always occupy this kind of uh, peripheral uh, position, even if um, even if actually many people to uh, use uh, these kind of services. So what happened uh, in the next uh, generation, because I'm just trying to do a really rough uh, periodization, came uh, instant messaging applications, and this really turned the whole thing around, because uh, at this time when we had uh, the chat programs, uh, most of these were, were uh, available uh, in the form of source code, and uh, most of these uh, could be uh, deployed uh, new nodes could be deployed, and most of these were uh, federated uh, protocols, so you could uh, you could set up new nodes. Um, of course, uh, IRC um, was the most durable example of this, and the first implementation dates back to 1988. Uh, that is one year before uh, the invention of the World Wide Web by Tim Berners-Lee in uh, 1989. Um, it was made uh, as a uh, auxiliary, auxiliary function of uh, bulletin board systems and uh, quickly got uh, ported to, um, to other media. So instant messaging applications uh, were kind of uh, uh, architectured in a really different way. They were produced by companies uh, where, uh, for example, with one of the first ones, ICQ, it was uh, the only uh, uh, product of the company. So this company was really about producing uh, uh, instant messaging application that uh, that people can download and install on their computers. Uh, Microsoft uh, followed suit with suit with uh, MSN. There is an interesting story there because before uh, the um, the MSN, Microsoft actually tried to commercialize IRC, and uh, this was uh, when. Uh, I think Windows 98 came with a, a program called Comic Chat, which was a product of the Artificial Intelligence Research uh, Laboratory inside uh, Microsoft, and tried to render IRC channels as uh, comic strips, and uh, decide on the facial expressions of the characters also based on uh, the text that they were saying. And uh, this was <coughs> this was not uh, uh, when we, when you clicked on this uh, application, it automatically connected to an IRC network that was maintained by Microsoft. But uh, you could also use it uh, for connecting to any network. It was a proper IRC client. However, Microsoft could not uh, figure out how to make uh, money, how to put a business model behind this uh, service. Uh, and uh, that's uh, where they closed the network. And uh, this application um, was shelved. Also, I think users um, found it really, really strange somehow. And the only thing that remains from this application is the Comic Sans uh, font that everybody knows now. <laughs> so the, we, can, we have to thank uh, the int artificial intelligence researchers in Microsoft for this font. <laughs> so um, there, with these instant messaging applications, uh, I guess all of you know they are based on uh, closed protocols. They have a centralized infrastructure. They connect to the um, to the servers of the company, and uh, at the same time, it was uh, still not clear how to make uh, money for these companies uh, from these services. You have a question? No, I didn't know. That that would be really uh, great to include. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great, and also, I mean, this is the the last. Yes. So, <coughs> um, so you are saying that uh, the multi-user chat of ICQ, uh, one of the first uh, instant messaging applications, was actually using uh, IRC to implement uh, this feature, right? And uh, this also shows the ma the main difference between uh, the applications before and uh, the, the second generations of uh, chat devices, because uh, on IRC and also on the mo more popular uh, versions of uh, chat programs before, um, the conversation was organized around uh, topics, uh, around a common interest, and uh, because uh, of this kind of organization, it could create communities of users. 
It could create user groups where people knew each other and uh, also at the same time they had the opportunity to get to know new users and collaborate with each other. <coughs> and uh, instant messaging applications uh, are organized in a totally different way. So the uh, multi-chat uh, is a kind of secondary feature there. The first feature is uh, to use the instant messaging application in the same way that uh, phones uh, are traditionally used. So to talk to people that you already know and to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And because of this, uh, I think it's, it's important to see that um, they are not uh, very effective in creating new communities. And this was, this was the really um, interesting feature of, of uh, chat before. So then uh, what happened was that uh, with the rise of uh, social media, uh, with the rise of social media monopolies, uh, people kind of forgot about the uh, internet, as uh, Schwa likes to say, and uh, then uh, people start to forget even about uh, the World Wide Web uh, and live uh, inside the uh, shilos of uh, Facebook, uh, Google, and Twitter. And uh, in this kind of uh, environments, the social media becomes um, simply something that is uh, there, and chat is only one of these features. So nobody starts up uh, Facebook uh, chat uh, separately, they just get these messages, messages when they are logged in. Um, there is a nice uh, study by uh, GSP, which is uh, showing how um, these platforms uh, try to become uh, a kind of uh, um, required uh, point of passage for all the information that is going on the internet. So they are trying to create uh, an environment where uh, it doesn't matter what people want to do, they have to do it through Facebook or through Google or through uh, Twitter. Uh, of course, the business model here became very clear. Um, so there are two uh, requirements that uh, have been both um, fulfilled by uh, data mining. On the one hand, uh, it is possible to accumulate uh, capital to make profit. Uh, by analyzing the uh, metadata that the users are generating. And uh, the second feature is that uh, um, these platforms contribute to the establishment of uh, social peace, uh, so they can uh, facilitate repression through, um, through creating an architecture where it's very easy to do surveillance of the users, because all the data is in one place, and these companies are very uh, visible and can have a good relationship to, um, to the authorities. So uh, what I wanted to say about these uh, uh, three things, if we look at them uh, from a wider perspective, is that uh, there was chat that was a kind of controversial thing at that time. At the same time, um, it fulfilled some kind of uh, uh, maybe universal human desire for people to talk to each other and to make communities, to develop trust, to collaborate. And uh, the subsequent uh, versions of this technology uh, started to um, be more useful for uh, making profit and also more useful for uh, controlling this uh, communication or even uh, not just the communication but what the people uh, do uh, with this opportunity to talk to each other. So uh, that's why it is interesting that uh, after all these three generations of uh, chat devices um, went down in uh, history, nowadays there are still people who use the internet relay chat. You know, I, I see. So um, I, I <coughs> my idea is that, uh, of course, most uh, histories of IRC kind of end um, let's say in uh, uh, 1999 or uh, 2002, 2003, because uh, they just uh, take the, the statistics of internet users and they see that uh, compared, to the <coughs> compared to the number of internet users, the uh, number of people who use IRC are uh, very small and statistically insignificant. So I tried to take uh, another kind of perspective and see that uh, what is the role of these uh, IRC users 
in determining the, the relationship between technology and politics, in moving the uh, whole technological landscape forward, and so on. And uh, I am trying to argue that uh, if we look at uh, media from a kind of ecological, from a more uh, qualitative point of view, then uh, it is not possible to say that IRC is an insignificant medium. Because for many other things that uh, happen, for example, even for a Facebook chat to exist, uh, there is a whole stack there uh, that makes uh, Facebook uh, chat uh, possible. And when, these, uh, when there are problems with the free software components that are be below uh, the proprietary layer that Facebook uh, puts on this stack, then the developers have to go on IRC and ask about uh, how this software uh, works and collaborate with uh, the producers of this software. So uh, even for the social media features to exist, um, the developers at some point have to utilize IR IRC to produce uh, these features. Um, so I identified that uh, nowadays people who use IRC are mostly collaborating with each other in what I call a peer production communities. So they are doing the collaborative production of something. And they produce software, they produce uh, political interventions, they produce uh, hardware designs, and they also pr produce knowledge. Um, I also thought, why is it that uh, even the studies that uh, are about specifically uh, these user groups don't really mention IRC as a specific uh, unit of analysis? And I realized that uh, most of the media and communication scholars are talking about things that appear on the front page of newspapers. So they are talking about uh, the, uh, the new things that come out or the uh, media that is really on the, um, uh, that really appears in the, inside the media. And uh, these uh, communities don't use IRC in, a, in the sense of advertising it. They use it in their everyday life. And they use it to, um, to uh, conduct their daily operations and also to so socialize. But for example, if you go to uh, the, the front page of Wikipedia, uh, they don't say, OK, come to our IRC channel. So um, it is uh, mostly uh, what I would call a backstage uh, infrastructure. Um, ah, yeah. Why is it also important uh, that uh, contemporary um, users actually choose IRC for their uh, collaborative and uh, social needs? Is that uh, there are many uh, studies of uh, people who refuse, these, these people are actually called rejectors, people who don't uh, adopt new technologies. And uh, the problem with, uh, with trying to produce uh, knowledge about uh, the political meaning of these rejections is that uh, these, us these uh, user groups uh, in the more uh, popular studies uh, are usually marginalized in society in some way. So for example, old people don't use the internet because they don't understand it. Or uh, people in Africa don't use some new technologies because they cannot afford it. So there is always uh, an explanation of why these people are not uh, normal, and that's why they don't use uh, some new technologies. And I saw that um, to show that that uh, the, ref the rejection of a new technology can be uh, a politically meaningful act, it is quite uh, uh, strategic to study use uh, to study uh, hackers as a user group, um, because there. Uh, hackers have almost all the privileges that you can gather in this society. So um, there is a good argument that uh, statistically um, they, we are talking about uh, well-educated, uh, technologically aware, uh, mostly uh, white, uh, mostly male, mostly middle class um, user group. So there is nothing to really marginalize this uh, this group and say that what they say doesn't really uh, matter or they don't understand this technology or they can't afford this technology. So who is using uh, IRC? That's kind of a straightforward thing and I guess uh, most of you are familiar with uh, these use cases. So free software developers have been on IRC since the beginning. 
and the big projects like the GNU project, uh, the Linux kernel, or uh, the Debian operating system, they all have their own uh, channels. These channels are even um, compartmentalized uh, sometimes into a minus dev and minus talk for development and for socialization. So, uh, and there is, a, uh, of course, there is a channel with the name of the project for the development uh, work. And uh, this, this nicely shows that uh, there are uh, these uh, three main use cases of uh, free software developers for IRC. So they use it to, for support, for development, and for uh, socialization. Um, just looking at what kind of bots the different user groups uh, um, develop and, and use on the IRC channels uh, can show how, in very different ways, they could integrate IRC into, um, into their work and into their life. So uh, free software developers uh, connect it with uh, revision control, with backtracking systems, and uh, most uh, importantly with continuous integration. So IRC bots can alert the developers if uh, the new software doesn't uh, compile or there is a regression of some uh, bug, it doesn't pass the test, and so on. Um, Anonymous is, uh, on the other hand, a quite uh, new group. So it really took off uh, since 2008 as an uh, uh, activist movement <coughs> with Operation uh, Channelogy uh, that was against the Church of Scientology. And uh, they, actually, they also chose uh, IRC as the uh, main platform also for the backstage operation. So you can find uh, many Twitter accounts and Facebook groups of Anonymous. Uh, but uh, the operations themselves are uh, most often uh, organized on uh, their own IRC networks. And this also shows that uh, free software developers could uh, organize uh, themselves in the open and set up uh, open networks uh, that, that uh, provide the service to the general public, uh, while uh, anonymous activists uh, could just choose to set up their own networks and to set up their own rules um, which are maybe a bit more paranoid or uh, simply set up their own networks because uh, they trusted the network operators more. So they could kind of fork, uh, um, let's say, the IRC infrastructure, which is quite important because this is something that, of course, you cannot do with uh, Facebook or uh, Twitter, and uh, you cannot escape the eye of the operators in this way. Um, I also uh, tried to argue along with uh, some other people, some other researchers, that uh, just the fact that, uh, um, that uh, anonymous activists use uh, IRC is uh, instrumental for this kind of swarm uh, subjectivity, where there are a few people, they start to do something, and then a lot of people pile up on the uh, top of them. And uh, this kind of uh, swarm logic um, the um, social movement researchers uh, argue that it's something new, and I'm trying to uh, to complement uh, this argument by saying that IRC channels somehow facilitate this kind of collaboration where uh, everybody is talking at the same time, uh, anybody can come and go. Uh, you want to say something? Features as well that you're not existent. You're not existing when you're not connected. I think that's an important feature why they took this part of the internet, they have this piece of physics where it only exists once you join it and there's no like roster, there's no I put you in my address book or something. Mm -hmm. It's just either you're there or you're not there. Well, that's it. So you are saying that um just the fact that uh, there is no uh, backlog on uh, IRC, that if you're not logged in, then you're not part of the conversation, or yeah, you're not even not present there, yeah. um, is a form of anonymity that is somehow close to the uh, way that Anonymous works and maybe structures uh, their social interactions as well. It's a form of software. Yes. And of course, uh, with the real name policies and so on, on the mainstream social networks, it would not be possible to uh, pseudonymously um, take part in these movements. Yes, indeed. And of course, uh, the most famous bots that they use are uh, the, um, I don't remember what is it called, the remote control feature of... Uh, Light? Hive mind. Hive mind, indeed. 
So uh, the most famous boat that they use is the hive mine uh, feature of the uh, Loic, the low orbit ion canyon, which is uh, quite uh, well, which is one uh, DDoS uh, tool. So users can uh, log into the IRC and then uh, give the control uh, to um, to the operators of the channel or to a specific user. And this is a way to coordinate uh, this uh, uh, DDoS attack. And of course, uh, uh, this is the same thing that criminals are doing with uh, botnets. Uh, so uh, botnets are also using IRC as a command and uh, control infrastructure. And uh, Loic is uh, simply changing uh, infected computers to uh, activists who give some kind of consent to this action. Well, uh, as I studied hackerspaces, this was uh, um, my entry to, um, to this uh, new research on IRC. And uh, hackerspaces are also some uh, uh, social formation that really became uh, a popular uh, genre of uh, organization since 2007. So once again, it's not possible to say that um, the only people who use IRC are the old people who have always been uh, there since the beginning. Uh, so this is also a, a more or less uh, different uh, social group, a more or less different user group that got on IRC and producing hardware and nowadays producing biology and still, of course, producing, um, taking part in politics and also producing uh, free software. So <clears throat> I guess one of the um, usages, one of the use cases of IRC in uh, hackerspaces is to uh, coordinate between people because hackerspaces are often 24 hours a day open and uh, the different people who use the uh, space, the members, um, have a, some of them have an eight hour uh, working day and then they come after work. Some of them don't have any, um, any jobs and uh, they just hang out uh, there all the time. Some of them are freelancers which, who may use also the uh, hackerspace as an office sometimes. So to coordinate uh, these very different people, uh, IRC is quite uh, handy to say who is there, to ask people what is going on in the hackerspace, or uh, in certain cases to, to check uh, that actually there is nothing in the hackerspace uh, happening at the moment, so uh, it's not worth to go in. Or, uh, as uh, my study of the door systems of hackerspaces show, sometimes uh, the IRC is the way to know that the hackerspace is closed, so it's nice if somebody goes there and opens it and then uh, maybe things uh, start to happen there. Um, so uh, since uh, hackerspaces are special because you can collaborate with people making hardware there, this hardware often, <coughs> this hardware often gets, uh, um, this hardware often ends up uh, getting hooked into IRC. And uh, of course the uh, classic case is uh, the door systems, when there is a button uh, near the door of the hackerspace, you push it and then it announces in a lot of different places, including IRC, that the hackerspace is open. So uh, Wikipedia editors also use IRC and uh, this is, they, they are trying to produce a kind of universal knowledge, an encyclopedia. And uh, this also became uh, popular only a few years uh, ago, so we cannot argue that this is just uh, uh, people who are still there from the 1990s, because in 1990s uh, Wikipedia didn't exist. Um, so here again it is a kind of space for backstage conversations, and actually I, I really recommend uh, Yemiya Nax, uh, ethnographic study of uh, Wikipedia, who uh, comes up with a quite uh, critical evaluation, saying that uh, there is a very codified language in which uh, Wikipedia editors have to communicate with, between themselves and uh, with the members of the general public. So if you say something uh, that is uh, not according to the uh, etiquette of Wikipedia, then uh, sometimes you get into a conversation uh, three years after that and people will dig it out and uh, they will use it against you. Uh, or if you don't uh, speak according to the ethical, uh, ad the etiquette uh, rules of Wikipedia, then uh, your argument is not taken seriously. So there is a kind of bureaucratization that uh, 
he finds in Wikipedia, where the people are forced to relate to each other in a, in a very specific way. And uh, how they use IRC is that it's uh, one of the few uh, media that are actively used by Wikipedia editors, but is not actively monitored and is not actively policed. So even on the <coughs> even on the Wikipedia mailing list, um, there is a public archive, and you have to watch what you say. And uh, of course, there are many heated debates and many conflicts. So. Um, in the same way that people have a kind of a rough meeting in the office and uh, uh, they try to argue with each other, but at the same time, uh, when the meeting is over, they go to the pub and uh, they uh, just uh, rant to their friends about how stupid their co-workers are. This is the kind of thing that you can do on uh, IRC. And this function kind of brings uh, IRC back to its uh, um, origin, where it was seen as a place where people talk about uh, bad things, useless things and uh, this kind of uh, things that uh, are more about creating uh, trust and a common feeling than about uh, um, creating some kind of product. So there are also uh, bots on Wikipedia which uh, allow uh, the uh, Wikipedia users to, um, to follow what the bots are doing, the Wikipedia bots, so not the IRC bots. There are many bots which uh, monitor um, Vandalism, for example, and there are vandalism channels in, uh, uh, for Wikipedia, where there are groups of uh, Wikipedia editors, and sometimes uh, bots are alerting them uh, that one page is uh, uh, being attacked by vandals, and then they hurry to the scene and uh, they try to um, hunt down the trolls. So why is it? Uh, why are these different use cases are important? I think they are important because they are showing that uh, there are new user groups, there are old user groups on IRC, and uh, they are using IRC in quite different ways. So there is a, a wide range of uh, uses of Wikipedia, uh, of, of IRC. But at the same time, all these groups somehow collaborate uh, to create something uh, together. They are not just, for example, fans of uh, cars that look at uh, pictures of cars. Um, so what is critical technology appropriation? Well, first of all, what I'm trying to argue that uh, how these uh, groups decided to use uh, IRC is an example of uh, critical technology appropriation because they didn't just uh, take uh, uh, Twitter or Facebook uh, or whatever is popular now and started to chat on them, but they looked for a chat solution that uh, is especially um, useful for what they are doing. So that's one reason is that uh, you can always take IRC and uh, you can make a network uh, which works in, a, in the way that uh, you want. And uh, with the social media, of course, you cannot do that. So what is, uh, when I say appropriation, it simply means that uh, a technology is not ready when uh, it simply works, but how users start to use it and uh, um, how different users uh, start to use it in a different way um, is a, a process where a social relationship is created and uh, technology is, uh, is better studied in this social relationship with its users. So just because a, a piece of software is ready, it doesn't, it doesn't have a fixed uh, meaning. This social meaning has to be given by the users and how the software will develop uh, depends on how users uh, are using it. So uh, one of the ideas behind this, what uh, critical uh, technology appropriation shows, that these groups uh, don't simply adopt uh, the new things. Uh, they look at uh, if the new things are better or worse than what was before. And uh, it also shows that some technological limitations can be a social advantage. Uh, sometimes uh, just uh, by themselves and sometimes because they force the users to create new uh, kind of social relationships that can replace uh, some technological functions that could be automated in the, in the technology itself. And I will uh, make the case about uh, exactly the backlogs of uh, IRC later. So um, I'm trying to see how um, these groups decide on uh, whether to adopt the technology or not. And because of this, I also started to look at uh, other social groups. 
And the first one and probably the most famous are the Luddites, who were uh, in the beginning of capitalism, and uh, they are famous as uh, frame breakers. So there was new kind of machines that were uh, factory machines, industrial machines for uh, producing textile. And uh, these uh, workers didn't like the idea of uh, factories, basically the idea of an uh, industrial capitalism. And they decided to destroy these, uh, these machines. So these machines, uh, some parts of these machines were called the frames, and that's why they are called frame breakers. And um, Kirk Patrick Sale has a nice uh, book on them, where, for example, he uh, says that um, when they wanted to get rid of the Luddites, they had to call in uh, more um, soldiers of the um, of uh, more English soldiers than uh, and they deployed against Napoleon. Uh, so uh, they were, this resistance was quite widespread and it was quite uh, effective. And uh, of course, how Luddites are known today is that uh, if somebody is a Luddite, then uh, these people are backward and uh, they just don't understand that the new technologies are necessarily good technologies. Uh, at the same time, the historical record doesn't show that the Luddites were not saying anything bad about new technologies per se. They were actually uh, quite um, sophisticated users of, uh, um, of textile making machinery and uh, all of them uh, had uh, textile making machines at home. Uh, but uh, they were part of a kind of cottage industry that was in the countryside, that was based on families and where they had a lot of control over how the production is happening. And what, uh, what they didn't like is that uh, with the new machines, they had to move into the uh, cities, they had to be part of a factory, and uh, they um, had to work um, the 10 hours, uh, 11 hours working day that was set by the factory owner. So what they didn't like about the, uh, this kind of technologies was that it was bringing another kind of, another form of life to them. And this was the form of life that they rejected. And that's why they broke these frames. So there is a, a, a quite clear criteria. When there is a new technology, you can ask uh, what kind of life is associated with uh, this technology. What kind of life you will live as a user of this technology. Another example is the Amish, um, who live a quite traditional lifestyle, uh, mostly in uh, rural uh, America in rural uh, United States, and uh, they have a council of elders, and when there is a new technology, then this council of elders have to make a decision whether they reject it or whether they adopt it. And uh, the question that uh, uh, they ask is whether this technology brings people together or uh, whether it sets them apart. And if uh, this technology is something that can bring people together, then they adopt it. And I think this is quite a, a nice uh, question also to ask about new technologies. And uh, I will not tell uh, you what are the criteria of uh, hackers. Um, for one, uh, because uh, I'm still in the middle of this research, so uh, I want to study it more. Uh, and for the other, because uh, one point of my talk is to um, to, uh, start to think about uh, what are these criteria or what could be these criteria or what are good criteria for adopting technologies. Um, so why is it important uh, how people, uh, well, why is it important that people critically adopt new, new, new technologies and not just adopt them? It's important because uh, then uh, it's not the designers of the technologies who decide on what kind of life users should have, but uh, maybe the user groups themselves can think about what kind of life they want to live and find the technologies that uh, reflect this. It's also important because uh, modernity works in this way that there are always uh, new technologies and there is always innovation. And uh, it's important uh, to have a kind of reflexive modernization where we actually think about the consequences of technologies. Um, I guess, for example, uh, biotechnology is now something that, uh, that is widely discussed, but there is not really a, a process to really think about what, if we like it or not, or if we will use it or not, and how. So it's also important uh, as an act of resistance to capitalism, uh, because capitalism always uh, takes this kind of uh, critique, for example, that was in the beginning of uh, of the IRC, or, uh, sorry, of the chat devices, 
where people started to talk to each other and uh, other people didn't uh, like that they are just talking about uh, whatever topics. And uh, then it starts to, um, to integrate it into capitalism to fulfill these two uh, criteria, making profit and uh, um, creating an environment, let's say, of surveillance where social peace can be established. So uh, sometimes uh, going back to a, a technology that, um, that ar arose um, from a kind of critical perspective is a critical act itself because you're not uh, serving the version of technology that, uh, that conforms to capitalism. So um, some people may remember uh, this kind of argument from my last uh, talk at the birthday of uh, Hack. So I'm trying to ask what are the criteria that allow a, um, a certain social group to do a critical appropriation of technologies. And in my research of uh, what kind of technologies hackers use and what kind of technologies re they reject, I came up with these uh, three criteria. And I think that all of the three are necessary to have uh, at the same time in order to have a critical point of view about the technology. So one is uh, actually the quotes are totally dif in different orders. So you, uh, you could try to find <laughs> which one belongs to which one. but. Uh, Historical experience is about comparing it to, the, to its uh, predecessors. So knowing if a technology is better than the last one, um, it also means that you have to know which was the technology before, right? And uh, I connect it also with an empirical, uh, I connect this argument with an empirical observation that in hackerspaces you can usually find old computers and uh, the, um, the generations, of, generations of technologies that are not used anymore. So um, people who go to hacker spaces are more likely to actually have experience with what were these technologies. The second is technical expertise. So um, you could also get this just by going to the university. But just by going to the university um, will uh, not necessarily uh, teach you how uh, technologies worked before and also doesn't uh, provide a semi-autonomous culture. So in a semi-autonomous culture, I mean that uh, hacker culture always uh, evolved uh, together with industry, but at the same time, uh, could, uh, it was not integrated in, into any modern institution like universities, uh, into companies, or, uh, or even any uh, nation states. So it had a kind of uh, distance and therefore, um, Inside hacker culture, it was possible to, to create, to form an independent opinion about technologies, which is independent in the sense that it's a, a point of view that is not determined by big institutions. So I'm trying to say that this is the three criteria that any social group would uh, have to have to do a really good critical appropriation of technologies. So um, there are a lot of uh, things that uh, I base on maybe a quite a, a weak uh, argument, but I find it very interesting uh, what Schwab was also pointing out that uh, IRC doesn't provide a backlog. So if you're not logged in, then you have no idea what happened before. Uh, this is quite, historically of course, this is quite unique to IRC. So all the other um, chat solutions try to provide some kind of uh, backlog. Let's say on Skype, uh, if you log back, you get your uh, messages. And of course, uh, IRC users often actually suffer from this problem. And that's why a lot of people run an IRC client on a server and then they connect to the server. And uh, therefore, they look like they are always uh, logged in. No? And for people who maintain computers, this is quite an easy thing to do because you work with the uh, servers and with command line all the time. So it's quite convenient actually that you can use a server and the command line to connect to IRC. It is a, it is a user friendly thing. But for most users, this is not really a, um, a friendly way, a very easy way to access this technology. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to argue that uh, this is one of the reasons why it has not been uh, uh, adopted uh, by, uh, by the wider population of the internet. Um, and uh, I'm even saying that uh, this is not necessarily a, a bad thing because this was uh, one of the reasons which uh, preserved 
the kind of, uh, some people said yesterday, the high quality community that is on IRC. Um, so it didn't become a kind of mass media that is uh, very similar to a television nowadays. Um, I also think that it's important uh, to look at IRC because there is an imminent critic of social media. So if you list the things why people use uh, IRC, what are the things that they like about it, you can also uh, make an argument that uh, all these things make social media bad. No, this is the kind of, this is the reasons why they don't use social media for this. And this is the problem with social media. So that's why I think that uh, studying IRC is not just important because of IRC, but because of all the different uh, chat solutions and social media that exist today. And uh, uh, of course, the uh, history of IRC is uh, split uh, all the way down in the sense that um, there was uh, one first uh, IRC network, and then people started to quarrel with each other. And uh, in every uh, the new IRC networks, usually came out from this kind of uh, conflicts where uh, the users didn't agree about how to divide the responsibilities uh, in maintaining the network, what kind of power uh, different entities should have. Uh, can anybody run uh, bots? Uh, can only channel operators authorize bots? Uh, who is responsible for keeping your nickname uh, when uh, you are not logged in? Um, should you be able to register a channel or anybody should register a channel whenever they want? This was the kind of questions that, uh, um, that people didn't agree on. And uh, actually they didn't have to agree. So this was the beauty of this story. Um, you could always uh, fork the network and create new networks. Indeed. CTA means uh, cultural technology appropriation. So uh, um, I have been and I am still working on other case studies as well. One of the interesting examples is the Nokia N900 mobile phone, um, which is also something that is old, something that is kind of uh, hard to use and actually doesn't uh, work perfectly, um, doesn't work even as well as uh, contemporary mobile phones. But a lot of hackers uh, still cling to this because they think that the new mobile phones are much worse than uh, this old one. So um, I was trying to study this uh, also to show uh, what is the problem with mobile phones today. And uh, therefore it is also a double uh, study because I'm studying why uh, hackers, even though they are associated with new technologies, they didn't adopt mobile phones uh, so uh, widely as other social groups. And at the same time, I'm studying what they are using instead of uh, these mobile phones. So the request policy browser extension is a kind of uh, uh, more complicated story, but that's also, I'm trying to say that uh, it's about uh, blocking uh, third party requests and blocking third party requests is a kind of attempt to uh, vi um, turn back the wheel of time to get uh, back to a, a previous um, paradigm of how web pages were composed. And uh, the BitLB um, IRC proxy is a way to um, make uh, Facebook and uh, Skype and uh, MSN look like an IRC channel. So uh, it's another way how um, some hackers try to uh, adopt to social, uh, to the technological progress, uh, but still preserve some kind of uh, good things uh, from these old technologies. And uh, of course, uh, the, the first uh, way that I'm trying to explain to people uh, what I, why I think that uh, all, using all technologies is an interesting thing in hacker culture is explaining that whenever we open a, a terminal, we have a kind of emulator of a VT100, uh, um, actually a piece of hardware from the DEC Corporation that was sold in, uh, I think, 17 million uh, copies. In, uh, and it was published, it was, uh, it was first put on the market in 1972. So the terminals that uh, can do more or less than the VT100 uh, are considered to be bad terminals. They are not really um, conformant uh, to the uh, specifications. And I think that this is uh, one of the examples where hackers really stuck to one thing. And uh, this was uh, creating a good basis for the innovations that could be put on the top of this. 
And uh, uh, a study that I didn't do, but I think would be very interesting, is how um, the hacker community is kind of uh, trying to defend uh, the CSV in its system and uh, um, rally against uh, systemd, because systemd doesn't uh, conform to the Unix uh, specification. So <laughs> I think this, this discussion really shows uh, hackers uh, at least in a totally opposite way than uh, sociologists uh, like to see hackers. Because uh, for sociologists, a uh, hacker is always about uh, creating some new technologies, uh, really rallying around some uh, uh, political question, um, and uh, really uh, going forward and adopting the new technologies faster than uh, the whole society. And uh, in the uh, CSV in it versus uh, systemd story, we can really see that uh, hackers feel very passionate about uh, very old technology. And uh, they are trying to um, kind of go against uh, progress. You don't feel passionate about old technology. You feel passionate about very about bad technology. Yeah, That's a very great point. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, indeed. Uh, in a way, I think that the idea behind um, these uh, studies that I'm trying to make is very, very simple. It just means that if you are passionate about technology, that doesn't mean that you love all, te all technology without exceptions. It means that you are passionate about some technology and you really hate uh, some other technologies. And there should be criteria uh, showing which one is uh, um, hateful and uh, which, which technologies um, are good for which, te which technologies can have good uh, social consequences. So uh, there is a couple of uh, misses, uh, some mythological uh, elements that I'm trying to criticize with this, uh, that belong to these large historical formations. The first one is actually an exception. That's more how um, sociologists talk about technology. Um, so when sociologists uh, study um, users of all technologies, Usually, usually the explanation comes down to a feeling of nostalgia. So, uh, for example, there is a famous study about uh, um, Tandy computers in the United States, and uh, the kind of analysis shows that these users feel a nostalgia for an old technology, and using this old technology um, provides them with an identity. And uh, they cultivate this identity by using the old technology. And uh, just using this old technology sets them apart from the masses who use some other thing, so they can, can, they can distinguish themselves. And uh, it is possible to make this argument, but I think that um, it's not very interesting to make this argument. So instead of this, I'm trying to uh, ask uh, what is the political meaning of uh, using old technologies beyond uh, creating an identity for a social group. Um, <coughs> So the next three things is generally the things that uh, um, that I hate the most, and uh, that uh, this hate is what is motivating uh, my research: um, modernity, capitalism, and liberalism. And uh, they more or less uh, have the same kind of uh, mythology built uh, into them. Uh, so modernity: if something is modern, um, it is closely associated with this idea of progress. And uh, what uh, is especially problematic for me is that usually the idea of technical, of, uh, technical progress um, is uh, tightly coupled to the idea of uh, social progress. So um, there is a kind of uh, default uh, point of view which says that uh, if we have a new technology, it will result in a better society as well. And the reason to adopt the new technologies is simply because we want to develop as a society. And uh, there is not really a concept in uh, the kind of mainstream understanding of, uh, of modernity of technologies that degrade societies. So even when you learn in school uh, how history works, you uh, learn that, uh, for example, uh, there was a way to, um, to make tunnels in Egypt, and uh, therefore they could um, cultivate a bigger patch of land. No? They could create a civilization there. But uh, there are few examples that are taught in the school where a te new technology appeared and this had uh, bad social consequences. Even though in the history of technology, it is possible to find uh, examples, of, ex examples like this. 
So in capitalism, there is also a kind of cult of innovation. And in fact, uh, not just in capitalism, but also in the academia. And uh, that is one of the re reasons why uh, most studies of hackers, but also most studies of technology, are uh, not about technologies that people actually use, but uh, about technologies that are famous at the moment because uh, they are new and uh, there are big promises associated with them. Um, there is also, uh, in the last and, uh, well, most uh, hegemonic uh, way that modernity and capitalism exist today, uh, there is a hegemony of uh, liberalism, namely neoliberalism, uh, which uh, imagines a society where everybody is an individual and the highest political um, value that you can fight for is individual freedom. Uh, and I think that this is deeply problematic because uh, um, it basically denies the possibility of a society it denies um, political values that are important for me, such as uh, building trust, creating solidarity, and uh, collectivizing uh, problems that you have also in life, but also in, in politics. So I think that uh, in order to change the, uh, the world, we have to um, create uh, groups, we have to build trust, and we have to create uh, collectives. And uh, there are technologies which help with this, and there are technologies um, which are harder to, to use for uh, um, doing these kind of things. And uh, I actually think that a lot of decentralized uh, technologies that I proposed uh, today imagine users as this kind of closed world um, who uh, communicate uh, with each other um, in the same way that uh, the ideal consumers communicate uh, with each other through a market, for example. And uh, that's the end of my talk. So um, this is my email address and my PGP fingerprint. And uh, you can see uh, the slides are online. You can find them uh, under this URL. What's your nickname on IRC? Um, <laughs> my nickname on IRC is Maxi Gaz. And yes, I am on the major networks. Thank you. So just to mention that the last slide of the talk I will not show, but uh, this is where all the references uh, that appeared on the slide are. So you can look it up if you want. Um, thanks. I once again would like to approve. Um, a few bits you may want to comment on and a question. Um, the, when Napster arose in 98, you had a way to chat with people, and I used to chat with people who had similar tastes than mine and similar type of collections to get recommendations. Mm -hmm. This was really powerful. Later on, SoSeq was developed around the notion of uh, channels and, and put this uh, habit of, I don't know how you will see it, at the, the core of the, the action of sharing music. Uh -huh. And to me, it's a very important part of the history of my, my chatting. Also, at this, another point, it's a friend who used ICQ when it was five digits to look for, uh, let's say, women in the same uh, city he was living, mm -hmm. for the same ages, mm -hmm. and before it was cool, uh, managed to encounter find new people thanks to the centralization of the, of the platform. Uh, also, when you list the, the Lodites and the such, um, I, we, we, especially we can since, go back to that. since you were in Toulouse uh, as well, uh, the people of Clodo, in the late 70s and early 80s in France, uh -huh. still not identified to this day, were setting factories of computers on fire. Mm -hmm. It's a very strong uh, uh, of technology in a debate about uh, putting every citizen under fire at the time. Um, my question being, uh, how do you relate that to the social dynamics of the adoption of uh, uh, tools integrating the notion of privacy from their inception? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of silk, for instance, mm -hmm. that I just vaguely know from when it was used by where's people back in the days when it was created. How these things develop? Does it follow some patterns that you do with mm -hmm. this or other ones? So, well, you asked uh, too many questions Sorry. and I already forgot half of them. But uh, <clears throat> just uh, to say, okay, to say about uh, privacy, privacy is a fundamentally liberal concept. So privacy is an individual right. Um, so you cannot uh, get a more um, um, exemplary liberalism than that. Um, 
And of course, the new uh, tools uh, for chat try to integrate privacy into their services. Uh, I think what is interesting in, uh, uh, in IRC is exactly this uh, idea of uh, channels and uh, the idea of uh, flags that can be associated also with channels. So um, there is a um, possibility in IRC to um, try to find technical solutions for creating, uh, let's say, uh, intimate spaces or uh, spaces where people feel uh, um, more protected. Um, and I think that maybe this is uh, something that can be used to rethink the idea of, uh, of uh, privacy and to find a concept that is uh, more worse to fight for than uh, just the idea that uh, you have a home, you live in this home alone and nobody is allowed to come in or you have to know who is coming in or um, to have this kind of idea of an individual as a closed uh, world. Um, about uh, how uh, I think that, of course, how I do, I, d I try to use a kind of dialectical method in a way. So whenever I write a study, I also try to write the opposite of the study. And uh, because I think that uh, usually um, things are uh, true at least uh, there and back, no? And uh, when you are going back, you can, you can kind of revise uh, the things that you found out. So for example, I think it, it would be very uh, nice to show how um, these instant messaging applications, which I think that that's a quite uh, well-made argument, that's quite a strong argument that they were uh, built around individuals and they were built around contact lists. And this is something that is missing from IRC. So I think that this argument is good, but I think that it would be very interesting to show how people were trying to subvert this logic and even how developers felt that when uh, they, they um, made a chat device that is like a phone, you have a contact uh, list and uh, you can chat with, uh, one by one with people, <coughs> then they felt that something is missing. So they tried to put in uh, some features that were kind of fi fighting against the logic of their application. And I think this is the kind of cases uh, where you could show, for example, ICQ and the users of ICQ and uh, the search feature of ICQ and so on. Search feature. Uh, go on. switching over to these uh, new services, new mm -hmm. so-called team-based uh, chat services. Uh, do you think IRC was widely used and is widely used because of the lack of, uh, of uh, like similar technology that is so easy to use? Or because uh, IRC is uh, somehow unique in another way? Like uh, people are using and switching to Slack and other uh, alternatives to IRC these days. So, um, indeed, um, there is a new generation of uh, chat devices that are specially about uh, chat, um, and uh, most of these are explicit uh, efforts to kind of uh, recuperate uh, or replace IRC. Um, usually with the proprietary application. And uh, I think that the history of IRC and the history of uh, chat uh, provides very good arguments to, um, for example, criticize uh, Slack and to try to make arguments why people should not uh, adopt uh, Slack. Even though I don't think that my research is about how everybody should use IRC. 
I I try to I think that why this story is important for me because it tells something more general about technologies and of course there may be groups uh, uh, the, um, that find uh, ways of chat that are better than IRC for them and. Uh, um, based on the same criteria, uh, this could be a good uh, solution or a best solution, no? Um, I didn't include uh, Slack and Matrix and uh, even XMPP um, in the research so far um, because XMP XMPP is a very complicated uh, story that is also something that um, didn't really last uh, as a a medium that has a stable user that has stable user groups, and with Slack, the problem is more or less similar. That when I can study a technology, is when there is a, a significant uh, user group uh, that already built a social relationship with this uh, uh, technology, and uh, I think it takes a few years to really see how Slack will come up before it can be um, studied as a historical formation, even if it is the history of the, of the contemporary. So um, I'm a bit afraid that uh, um, this research will take three, four years to finish, and by this time IRC will actually disappear from the media landscape. Uh, this is one possibility. But another possibility is that uh, Slack is just the um, fashion of this year and uh, next year actually um, the companies will uh, drop it. So I would have to really see that it has an adoption and uh, how uh, it is adopted. Um, Stef? Yeah, yesterday we had a talk by Tom Peter uh, and he was talking about his company. It is an open source pen testing company and they use everything and uh, they call it chat ops and they have mm -hmm. rocket chat chat rooms, I guess, but it's, uh, they have some IRC gateway, but it's disabled. So yes. They, this company actually conducts the whole pen test over an IRC channel in a web browser, basically. You write your reports and you do your scanning and everything um, in, in a web browser channel, uh, IRC channel, I guess. So you know this, uh Code more or less, but uh, I don't think that. All those implementation uh, of like the and Slack and whatever you can con you can connect for IRC. I don't know if some of you used it for a longer period of time. Yeah. It no. actually doesn't it. work. Is it? Okay, so I, I you're the first person who says that um, it works over a longer period of time. But okay, just as a side note. So, so the comment was about that. Uh, <coughs> For a lot of technologies that are alternatives to IRC, you can connect to them through IRC, right? And Slack would be one yeah, example that like this. What we, you were talking about, so mm -hmm. I just wanted to yes. relative this, yeah. like, to balance it yeah. out because you can theoretically connect to IRC, yes. but like, actively using it over a longer period of time, you're the first one who says that works. Yes, uh, so one of, the re one of the interesting things about Slack is that it actually at least tries to be compatible with IRC. And uh, in fact, one of the killer features of uh, Slack is exactly um, this central characteristic of, of IRC, which makes it, an in, uh, which makes it uh, interesting, is uh, the lack of backlog. So Slack uh, actually stores your uh, conversations on the server, and when you reconnect to Slack, uh, you see what was going on before. And uh, I guess that uh, fixing the backlog problem of IRC can actually lead to a, a wide adoption. And I think that it, that is more or less what we are seeing uh, nowadays. At the same time, uh, just the fact that Slack tries to be compatible with IRC shows that IRC is still something uh, that uh, has to be counted with. So we are running out of time, so uh, this will be the last question. Yeah, so the comment was that uh, Slack tries to re-implement a lot of features of IRC 
um, and just uh, provide a bit uh, um, more easy to use uh, interface uh, in order to become popular. So I think the rest of the questions we can have uh, later and uh, we, we are moving to the next talk.